an admonition against profane and common swearing in a letter from a minister to his parishioner, to be put privately into the hands of persons who are addicted to swearing. By the Right Reverend Father and God Edmund Gibson, late Lord Bishop of London, 22nd edition here, published in 1771. My, how things have changed. I'm going to read this. Just amazing. Some of the points that this man brings up and how things have just changed so much. You know, I got, I got people all upset at me because I said Christians don't swear. And people got all angry about that. I didn't say they don't let a word slip out by accident or whatever else. I didn't say that. I said if there's profanity and there's no conviction of conscience or anything else, they're not saved. But let me let me read this. I'm going to share one verse of scripture at the end of this thing, but uh, let me just read this. Neighbor, it is out of a true respect I have for you and in hearty and a hearty concern for the good of your soul that I put into your hands this private admonition against swearing, since the public warnings you have heard from the pulpit do not seem to have had their effect upon you. If you will think and consider, you cannot but know that the custom of vain swearing into which you are unhappily fallen is a great sin, against which God has announced very heavy judgments, and how nearly it concerns me, who am your spiritual pastor, to warn you of your danger. You will see by the command which God has laid upon every pastor of his church, Ezekiel 3.18, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest not to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Wherefore I beseech you to take this admonition in good part, and to listen to, listen to it as a warning sent you by the providence of God to deliver your soul from eternal destruction. Do not spend time in guessing or inquiring how I came to understand that you are particularly guilty of this sin, but since you know it to be true, and the consequence of your going on without reproof should have been your ruin forever, Esteem it as a special mercy and favor from God, and in token of your receiving it as such, consider and lay to heart this plain account, number one, of the sinfulness of vain swearing, number two, of the folly of it. Number one, consider the great sinfulness of this practice, which you may easily learn as well from the pre express precepts where the scripture forbids it, as, many, as from the many aggravations of the guilt of this sin above any other. Consider how plainly the scripture forbids all idle and vain swearing of what kind soever, whether by things in heaven or things on the earth. To begin with the use of the name of God, which is so often in the mouths of common swearers, you know what the third commandment tells you, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. For although this commandment is given as given to the Jews, was only understood to forbid perjury or false swearing, Yet being interpreted in a Christian sense, it is a precept against all vain and common swearing, and especially by the name of God. I shall put you in mind, by and by, how expressly our Savior forbids Christians to swear by the creatures forbidding, or because of the relation they bear to their Creator. And because as they are the creatures of God, to swear by them is in effect to swear by God. And then it must be a sin of a much higher nature for men in their common conversation to, to swear directly by God Himself. The name of God is pronounced in Scripture to be holy and glorious and reverend, and it is one part of the prayer which our Savior taught us, that God's name may be hallowed, that is, that it may be thought and spoken of by us and all other persons with great seriousness and reverence as a name that is sanctified and set above common and ordinary use, which ought to teach all Christians to use it sparingly and reverently, not to bring it too familiarly, into any of their discourses concerning the affairs of this world, much less to mix it daily and hourly, as the common swearers do, with their sports and passions, their riots and excesses. The same thing is to be said of the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of mankind, concerning whom the Scriptures declare in Philippians 2.9, that God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, a declaration that should teach every Christian the greatest reverence to that holy and blessed name through which alone he can be saved. 
And yet, how little is this remembered or regarded by many careless and profane Christians who allow themselves in a wicked habit of bringing in the name, sacred name of Jesus and Christ to express their wonder and confirm their promises or purposes in the most slight and trivial matters. Or if they forbear to use the names of God, of Jesus and Christ, they will not scruple to swear by their Maker or their Redeemer, although these and the like, being only other names for God and Christ, are as much a profanation when they are mixed by men with their ordinary discourse as the direct use of the, of the names themselves. And the reason is plain because by the names of Maker and Redeemer the divine beings are evidently expressed and understood, and it is from the common and familiar use of matters holy and divine that the sin of profane swearing arises but by whatsoever names the divine things or beings are expressed. The reason why such names ought not to be mixed with the common concerns of the world is because they are of a divine and heavenly nature. We ought not to make the names familiar because the beings meant and expressed by them are infinitely above us in station, power, and all other perfections, and are therefore the proper objects of our dread and fear, our honor and reverence. Again, such names ought to be used sparingly because common use... Where because common use wears off the veneration that belongs to those high and glorious beings, and by decrees, degrees brings the most sacred things into contempt. For it is in vain to hope that the mind will preserve a serious regard to the beings if the tongue be allowed a common and unserious use of the names. Number three. Next to the profane use of such names as signify beings that are divine, it is like profane use of words which signify things of a divine and holy nature, such as, a, such as are proper only to religion and the concern of our souls and another world, as our faith, our redemption, our salvation, or in general any expressions which are per peculiar to the holy scriptures. These are weighty and serious things, and as the things immediately concern religion, so the names and expressions are only proper to religious exercises and discourses. And it is by no means consistent with a Christian conversation to use them otherwise than seriously, much less to a habit of using them lightly, and <clears throat> least of all to frame them into jests, to which the language of Holy Scripture is so frequently abused by profane men, or, what is our present case, to frame them into oaths and curses. And yet how common it is with many Christians in their ordinary discourse to desire this, or that to be done for the love of God, or for the sake of God, or of Christ and to declare the most trifling things to be true with a solemn vow upon their faith or upon their salvation or as God shall save them or judge them and to vent their rage and passion and horrible oaths by the blood and the wounds of the Son of God and the Redeemer of men, the hearing of which is enough to make any serious Christian to tremble. All such oaths as well as those others by the names of God and Christ and of our Maker and Redeemer do carry in them a double guilt. Number one, the profaning of things by common use which are sanctified to a religious use, and which, as they immediately relate to the great business of another life, do require our most serious thoughts and meditations, and ought never to be uttered in an idle or trifling way. And number two, the guilt of rash and vain swearing, which men are not called to it, when men are not called to it, and there is no real occasion for it, nor any good or wise purpose served by it. Number four, for although the swearing by things that are holy is a great aggravation of guilt, as it adds profaneness to the sin of swearing, yet it is to be remembered that all vain swearing by what things soever in heaven or in earth is expressly condemned and forbidden by our blessed Savior. Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 through 37 says, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your com communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And in like manner, St. James, chapter 5, verse 12, Above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. These are plain and positive precepts which ought to be well considered and understood by the vain swearers, as directly forbidding that which they, in contempt of the authority of our blessed Savior and his Apostle, make their daily and hourly practice. And the things which they ought to know and observe concerning them are chiefly these. Number one, that they were occasioned by a mistaken opinion among the Jews that if they did not swear directly by God, it was no sin to swear by his creatures. 
And considering how common it is among Christians to swear by the heavens, by their life, by their soul, and by other creatures of God, one would think they were of the same opinion of the Jews, and have never heard of those clear and direct precepts of the gospel against it. Number two, they are to observe the reasons why our Savior and his apostle forbid this sort of swearing, both because the creatures of God are not in our power to be used by us otherwise than, than he has appointed, and because the immediate relation which they bear to God as their creator makes us makes the swearing by them in effect a swearing by God. Number three, the common swearer is more especially concerned to observe the cause and the consequence of this sin, the cause and what and what our Savior here tells him, that it cometh of evil, either of an evil heart, void of all reverence toward God, or of the evil one, that is of the devil. The consequence in what St. James adds, that it brings them into condemnation. Number four, let him diligently attend to that most excellent rule for the daily conversation of a Christian. Let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay, in your common discourse, of which our Savior is speaking. Go no further in enforcing what you say than, than, than bear affirmations and denials in courts of justice and to serve any serious and weighty purpose. An oath in truth and righteousness may, be, may lawfully be taken, but in ordinary discourse, what our Savior Christ has here said must be the rule of every person who desires to maintain a Christian conversation. Hitherto ye have seen the sinfulness of common swearing and every practice that is sinful being a transgression of some law. I have shown you that this is a transgression of a plain and positive law given by Jesus Christ. And the more clear and expressed this law is, the greater, the greater is the guilt of going on in an open contempt of it. Secondly, you shall, know, you shall now see the aggravation of guilt, which render common swearers more wicked and inexcusable than any other sinners whatsoever. Pay attention to this. One great aggravation is that there is no temptation to swearing. By the commission of most other sins, some natural desire or inclination is satisfied, or some present interest is served. But the common swearer has nothing of this to plead in his excuse. He cannot say there is anything in his constitution that inclines him to swearing, or that he serves any worldly purpose or advantage by it. And therefore he sins for the sake of sinning, only to defy and provoke God. Now the less temptation there is to commit any sin, the commission of it becomes more inexcusable and a higher contempt of the authority which has forbidden it. And since there is no temptation at all to vain swearing, it is in the respect, this respect more inexcusable and a greater degree of perverseness and a more obstinate contempt of God and his laws than any other sin. Another aggravation of the guilt of common swearing is the frequency of it, that it is repeated every day and every hour, nay, almost every minute after it has grown into a habit. Oaths flow from such men without thinking and are a constant and almost necessary part of their mirth, passion, and discourse. Now, if every single act of sin renders us guilty in the sight of God, what a dreadful degree of guilt must rest upon the soul of the common swearer who is perpetually adding to the account and heaping up wrath against a day of wrath. The tongue is a nimble member which moves swiftly and if ill employed, multiplies sin apace and as the noblest work that belongs to it, is to set forth the praises of God on earth, as the saints and angels do in heaven, so he who accustoms it to oaths and curses is daily preparing it for the language of hell. And the time is coming, if he repent not, when he will have cause to wish a thousand times over that he had been born as dumb as the beasts that perish, or since he was not, that he had perished like them. When you have read and considered this short account of the sinfulness of common swearing, go on and reflect seriously in the next place. Secondly, the second part of this. Upon the great folly of it, consider how men fall at first into the custom of swearing, that it is never taken up, as all wise designs are, with consideration, or upon a foresight of any benefit that is likely to arise from it, but is usually owing to profane company, and suffer to grow into a habit, uh, though a supine careless humor, through a supine careless humor, for what for want of thinking what is right or wrong, lawful or unlawful, wise or foolish. And no practice can be more unreasonable than that which is owing purely to the want of thought, and which men never call, could fall into if they would think, that is, if they would make use of their reason and show themselves men. Real men don't swear, in other words, he's saying. Accordingly, we see this sin 
reigns most when men are least themselves in times of rage and passion and drunkenness, when their reason is gone, and they are indeed no longer men. Nay, some are never guilty of swearing, but in those short seasons of madness, being able at all other times to see the folly of it, and to comply with their judgment and conscience in abstaining from it. Which should make the common swearer ashamed, to see that he is doing that all day long, which others, and they none of the most innocent, neither will do but in a fit of madness. And these last do so far well to abstain from it at all other times, but their fault is that at the, those times they are apt to excuse it and scarce allow it to be a sin because they say they are not themselves. Whereas if they would reason truly and like Christians, it must be thus, that since rage and passion and drunkenness are very sinful and to be avoided by every Christian, though they be single and alone, they in whom they are generally accompanied by swearing are bound to double diligence to it in avoiding them because they know they usually bring with them a double guilt, namely their own and that of vain swearing. One sin can never be a just excuse for another, but it is a good reason why men should increase their care and watchfulness against one sin when they know it usually brings another with it. But though these... But but though these fits of madness into which men cast themselves were any excuse for swearing, as they are certainly none, yet the common and habitual swearer would have no right to plead them. For however they, make, uh, they may make his oaths more dreadful and more horrible than any that at other times, yet when these heats are over, his course of swearing and profaneness goes on, and his is so far from seeking excuses and endeavoring to charge it upon passion and drunkenness that he seems to approve and choose it adding a grace, a credit, or credit, or authority to this discourse. But what gratefulness can there be in a language which none of us but this the wild, unthinking, profligate part of mankind, and which gives great offense and uneasiness to every sober and good man, and I may add a language which is nowhere so common as among the meaner sort and in the most unpolished conversation. And as to the gaining credit or belief to what he says, it, wells, it were well if he would at least refrain from oaths till his credit is called in question, but where swearing is grown into a habit, it breaks out equally upon any occasion or no occasion, and in cases where there is most occasion, that is, when they cannot easily make themselves believed, it stands them in no stead, because none will believe him the more for swearing, who is known to have lost all reverence for an oath. The bare word of a sober, serious man has far more weight than a thousand oaths of the common swearer. Nor is he less mistaken when he supposes that bold and outrageous swearing adds to his authority and makes him appear brave and terrible in the eyes of his inferiors. It is true, rage and fury are the usual forerunners of violence, and these force obedience for the time. But as violence makes him inwardly hated by his servants, so swearing makes him pitied and despised by them, and both together make him accounted little better than a madman by all about him. The only true way to be sure of duty and respect from inferiors is calmness and decency in the commands and admonitions of the superiors. And while men fancy they show the greater courage and bravery, the more frequent and horrible their oaths are, they should consider what wretched courage that must be which consists in provoking and defying Almighty God. For this is the folly above all follies, that though men know the judgments which God has denounced against this sin and what will be the portion of divine profane and common swears, excuse me, they will yet go on so perversely and obstinately to pull down the divine vengeance upon their own heads. You cannot no, but know how expressly the scripture declares that God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain, Exodus 20, verse 7, and that the sin of vain swearing proceeds in a particular manner from an evil heart or the evil one, that is the devil, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, and that brings men into condemnation, James chapter 5, verse 12. If you knew these things, why would you suffer yourself all this while to be led by a foolish habit and unreasonable humor to defy God and destroy your own soul? If you did not know or consider them before, lay them seriously to heart now, and as you desire the favor of God and the salvation of your soul, continue no longer in a practice which you know will deprive you of both. Believe me, it is a warning of too great moment to be slighted, and therefore read and mark diligently what I have drawn up to convince you of the sinfulness, the folly, and the danger of vain swearing, and reflecting at the same time how long you have lived in this course, and what a dreadful number of oaths you have already uh, to account for, 
Humble yourself in the sight of God and earnestly bewail the profaneness of your life. Atone for what is past by a hearty sorrow and repentance and satisfy yourself that your repentance is sincere by entering into the firmest resolution that from henceforth your conversation shall be such as becomes the gospel of Christ. And remembering how difficult a thing it is to govern a tongue that is accustomed to swearing, from which oath, oaths slide unawares, first pray to God that he will enable you to set a watch before your mouth and keep the door of your lips, and then request of those with whom you most frequently converse that they will be your monitors, if at any time you happen to forget yourself. By these means you will be happily delivered out of a course of great sin and folly, and of infinite danger to body and soul. And if this admonition prove the first occasion of your deliverance, as I hope by the blessing of God it will, praise and adore the goodness of his providence, who hath not suffered you, go, you to go on securely in your sin, and make yourself the instrument of his glory, by endeavoring to reclaim others from the same unhappy course, which is the most proper satisf satisf satisfaction, excuse me, you can make to God for your former profaneness. You cannot think that I have any other motive in sending this besides my own duty and your good. It is a satisfaction to me to have gone thus far in the discharge of my duty as a minister of Christ and as your spiritual pastor, but it will be a much greater comfort to find that this admonition proves effectual upon you, and that God who worketh in all both to will and to do will, buy, will be graciously pleased to make it effectual in the earnest is the earnest prayer of your truly loving and affectionate friend and pastor. Wow. What an amazing thing. And here we have this letter, this tract, written in 1771. I didn't preach half that hard in my study saying Christians don't swear. And you, I get labeled all kinds of names and everything else, and I'm teaching false salvation and all that. And yet you have the Bishop of London the head of the Anglican Church in 1771, and he writes a thing like that. And he also wrote uh, and compiled some of three volumes of a book called Preservative Against Popery. <laughs> My how things have changed with the Church of England, you know. Just insane. But uh, remember, I was going to read a verse there. Proverbs chapter... Um, 29 verse 24 looking over there I have it written over there Proverbs chapter 29 verse 24 whoso is partner with a thief hateth his own soul he heareth cursing and bereath it not if you're a partner with a thief you hate your own soul you'll hear him cursing and you don't say, hey, don't, don't talk that way around me. You bereath it not. You know, I've been around people and they get to talking to me and, I, and they say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a preacher. And all of a sudden, their speech cleans up. And I don't say to them, hey, you need to quit that swearing and whatever else. I don't even need to say it. I've been around lost people, all ages, different races, whatever else. They all clean up their speech. I've seen that. I've seen wicked, profane people out in public and my wife will walk past them in a, in a modest dress and they'll clean their speech up. If you're a professing Christian and you can't control your mouth, you need to get that thing fixed up quickly. Because I would disagree with a lot of things with this bishop here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the guy was a wonderful Christian man and whatever else. I don't know. I haven't really looked into the guy's life in, in great detail. But I'll tell you what, I do agree with one thing you're going to have to answer for what you speak. And if you profess to be a Christian and yet you don't control your mouth and you're using all kinds of profanity, that's a serious problem. And let me tell you something. If you can watch television or movies or listen to music and hear profanity and hear God's name being taken in vain and it doesn't bother you and it doesn't make your skin crawl, you need to check yourself. I hate profanity. I can't stand it. And if I'm out someplace in public and whatever else and I hear somebody just bleep, 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 I'm going to go over and say something. The devil, his greatest um, scheme is to make people think that they're saved when they're not. 
The devil is very interested in religion, extremely interested in religion. And he wants very, very, very much to damn as many people through religion as he can. And I'll tell you, it's a very, very simple little test that you can make. Written by the Bishop of London, for crying out loud, in 1771 against profane and vain swearing. And here we are today. And I'm sure back then they wouldn't have even dreamed of the kind of profanity that goes on around this country and around the world. I mean, up until, what, 100 years ago or so? Not, well, not even 100 years ago. Back, you know, 1950s, 1960s, they couldn't even use profanity on television. And now you get people who profess to be Christians defending the use of profanity. You better get your salvation figured out. You have no conviction over profanity? Uh, you, better, you better talk to the Lord about that. Okay? That is going to be it. Thank you for watching.